Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to the Mapbox Navigation Ask Me Anything. So a little bit of administrative stuff to get us started. Uh, how to participate. Use the chat at the bottom of your screen for like general comments and conversations. If you want one of our panelists to answer your question or find an answer for your question, submit your questions on the Q&A button. It makes it easier to keep track. And if we have to follow up afterwards, we can have just a consolidated sheet to go back and look at. Ask as many questions as you like. We're here for your, it is your time, not just ours. Um, but like introduce, everyone who's here to help us out. My name's Ryan Leidig. I'm the product manager for all of our logistics APIs. So the matrix, the optimization, and the isochrones. Um, Antonio is our senior engineering manager for MapGPT. Balas is our product manager for our EV platform. Mike is our product manager for navigation SDKs. Robert's here from our technical support engineering questions. He'll be able to answer more, even more general and implementation questions around rather than just specific product questions. And Trey is going to be not only being the senior manager for our navigation API, he's going to be helping me out filtering the questions and getting things through and to us. So I will leave that up for everybody to say. I believe we already have some questions started. So Trey, which one should we go with first? Yeah, we can take one. There's one coming from Liam. Okay, so Liam, any possibility wants to know any possibility to allow users to submit a network of segments like polylines and have a Mapbox engine create a sort of routing pathfinding mechanism based on user submitted contact? Yes, the answer yes, but I, who's the best person to answer that? Yeah. I, I guess we got a uh, similar question in our uh, nav, nav yeah. session as well. So I think I can, I can take this one. Um, so uh, so yes, so the good news is that we are adding more flexibility into our routing engine, uh, which is the directions API. And uh, you'll be able to create very soon uh, more customizations in terms of areas where you want your vehicles to route to and the areas where you don't want to route to. So that means you'll have more control on the pathfinding mechanism, like the M, you, you, you put it very well. Uh, so this would be, there, so there will be some limits in terms of how much of a content you can upload. So similarly, for example, if you have preferred areas where you want to, your let's say heavy, heavy, heavy trucks, you want to prefer certain kinds of trucks, specific kinds of um, areas, and you want to avoid areas which are narrow or more uh, risk prone like school zones, and you can bring all of this custom data uh, to the platform and not just you can visualize them, but you can also uh, use them in, in our routing engine. Uh, the, we're trying to understand right now what are those kind of limits and the uh, like U, UI for developers, how they'll interact with the system. But this is an active area of uh, development. Uh, we are running POCs and working with a uh, few customers, uh, specifically uh, areas, use cases where there is huge, that's a cost of not adhering to certain regions. For example, uh, we are working very closely with micro mobility customers, how we can make their uh, navigation for uh, e-scooters, e-bikes, much, much more safe. Uh, there are regulations which vary from city to city, county to county, state or country level, uh, where you can or you cannot park your uh, e-scooter, where you can actually drive your scooter. So there are some cost implications for these use cases. And uh, that is how we are trying to uh, understand what are the uh, gamut of all the uh, kind of polylines and polygons, which which makes sense for supporting these use cases. And this is an activity of investigation. Uh, we, this, the timelines would be somewhere uh, in the first half of the year and starting off with a little bit more on the bicycle uh, kind of uh, profiles, uh, and we'll slowly migrate this to bring it to more driving and more conventional kind of a routing paradigm. Uh, so, Liam, I mean, we I, we are product managers, and sales can reach out to you to, so that you can come and join us and give early feedback into what we are trying to build and give you a little bit of a sneak pre sneak uh, sneak uh, preview of that. I hope that answers the question. If not, please uh, feel free to use the chat or submit Q and A more. Cool. All right. This next question is for Fawaz. This is from Andrew. Andrew says the Mapbox direction has an EV option, and he's found it hard to use because he had to track down the energy consumption curve and EV charging curve for each EV, which is not easy to do. We we know. We know. Do you have... <laughs> 
Do you have any, is there any plan to include or preload the data for different EV models similar to charge trip? If not, do you have any suggestions on how to track down the cars? So uh, thanks, Ryan, and thanks, uh, Andrew, for the question. I can uh, I can help answer that one and Trey uh, jump in to, to help uh, add more details. Um, Yes, the answer is is we don't have something right now, but we are thinking of providing that feature um, to our customers. We are mainly considering um, the charging curve that we get from vehicles that we work with, that we have integration uh, through our SDKs and um, and uh, products such as like the General Motors uh, who are using our Dash application or Toyota that I use our Dash application as well, or as navigation SDK. Um, it's it's something that we've been thinking about uh, lately uh, more about how can we expand the routing engine to um, enable developers to be able to hook this up to any application. Um, but for the moment, we don't have anything right now um, that can provide this. Um, Shrey, anything you want to add? Uh, so our approach is. Uh... I think the observation is absolutely correct, uh, Andrew. Uh, our approach has been, how can we make the APIs as flexible for like, a variety of like use cases? Uh, so uh, Mapbox works very closely with developer community, uh, which gives maximum flexibility, but we also work very closely with OEMs because we know how important it is for EVs to like EV services to integrate very closely with the battery systems. Uh, so. Whether you can model EVs, yes. The answer is yes. It has uh, all uh, the necessary, we believe, kind of flexibilities, if not all of them, to model. How our customers are using these APIs, there are two ways to do it. So if you are very closely working in, let's say, in an OEM space, you know the characteristics of your car, how does it deplete energy, how does it charge in different settings. Can you hear me? Oh, your vi your video did freeze though, Shrey. Yeah, just building on on that, I guess the um, building on what Shrey was continuing to say is like, you know, providing that that data set like and I lost my audio. <laughs> yeah, can you hear me? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so we have, have working with two sets of customers. So, if you know your battery system, you're working very closely with OEMs, um, either for them very closely, or you are part of the OEM dev, dev community. You already have access to the specific models you're beginning to launch for this battery depletion curve, charging curves, depending on weather, temperature, and BMS systems. Uh, but if you are, if you don't have access to those. Uh, what are other what most of the developers right now are doing is there's enough uh, data public database of EV uh, vehicles available in the web which people are uh, sharing open source. So a lot of the dev, dev community are using those open source kind of uh, vehicle curves and translating those into the API uh, EV routing API what we have and they're getting great results. Um, so I think what we need in the EV, EV routing API, if you have a, a strong kind of a baseline of what a model expectation is, particular model make a year and the life of the battery, if you're able to model that with open source databases, uh, the EV routing API and the navigation we are building will also adjust, self adjust uh, in future uh, to some of the custom like driving patterns of the vehicle and the person. So we'll also learn this over time for specific kind of like uh, uh, users users who is coming from a different kind of a UID and vehicle base. So no PIA would be take fact, but we will learn at aggregate level and also at a trip level. So having a very solid baseline is important. We understand that. Uh, we'll be happy to share some resources um, after the chat if you if you're interested to like find more information there. Cool. Oh, thank you. All right, this question from David. Can the navigation SDK provide driving directions to a location like a trailhead and then provide walking, hiking, or cycling directions once the user arrives there? Mike, I believe this is a nav SDK question for you. Yeah, thank you. So, and and also, Antonio, I could probably, you might have some some insight here as well. Uh, but to to get started, yeah, so the, the you know, you would have that, that trailhead that's noted if it's on or right near a drivable surface and, and an actual roadway, 
then then providing turn by turn directions to get there is is no problem. Um, where the, it might be expected that the last you know hundred meters or so might be it might be walked. Um, <clears throat> the now then the other question is, can you then provide you know maybe navigational directions through a trail? Uh, and that becomes a little more complicated. The right now the the driving directions are optimized for providing turn by turn directions that are most relevant for for driving uh, and for for vehicle on public road use cases. Um, once you get to the trailhead, then then that that becomes a little bit different how how we'd be navigating you uh, through that area. So um, I will, David, I put into the chat. We work with all trails, which is, I think they're only in the United States, um, doing exactly this. And it shows all the hiking trails and it show it's in their app and you can search by it. They have a really unique uh, application that we don't usually do is that they use one of our isochrones APIs and you can say, hey, tell me all the hikes or bicycle trails or whatever you're looking for within two two hours or whatever time you want. And it will return based on drive time. And you're able to share that with your friends. Like, hey, here's all the ones that are close by. Which one do you want to do today? So that's that's kind of a cool thing. I put a link to our showcase in there. We also, from the, the keynote this morning, is Decathlon. Decathlon does a similar thing in Europe. So... Um, Next question is from Daniel. Custom data sets for navigation was mentioned in the previous session. Do you have any details how that could be used to support routing for transit vehicles through like private bus only roads? Will the custom data sets still be subject to the limitations of the current driving profile that stops navigation short of private road and starts it on public road? Shrey, I think that's probably you. Yeah, I believe we uh, answered uh, partially that question before from Liam, when Liam asked. Yes, the answer is uh, we we will support this in bicycle profile and then also in driving profile because driving profile is the most commonly used uh, profiles where these customizations are very useful. Uh, but at the beginning, what we believe is private roads uh, would be something will not be supported at the beginning. Uh, so for, for the next year, uh, we're mainly looking at uh, road 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 networks, which is available inside Mapbox, which is publicly available and free to drivers. For private road areas, it's usually uh, uh, more customers are able to provide uh, a visual representation of the uh, private road network where you can create like dotted lines and give information about this road as private. Uh, and those would, uh, initially this would not be supported, but we do have plans to, how to bring this private road infrastructure also part of the routing influences, especially we understand for commercial fleets and this area, this this kind of information could be like very, very uh, helpful. Um, yeah, I, I hope that answers cool. the question. Thanks, Trey. Um, Tina's asking, is it possible to change values like contrast colors in an area around an object to illuminate or highlight the area around an active route in navigation? I think that's probably a mic question again. Yeah. So the the sorry. Which which question? So this is Tina's question is: Is it possible to change values like contrast colors in an area around an object? Yeah. Okay. So for example, one of the things that that might be done is like the route. Maybe you want that route to have like a, a glow or or a hue to it. Um, that that's currently not available to today at this point. Um, but it, it's good to kind of hear. Here, folks interested in that feature because it it is something that that we're developing and and we'll be able to support I think in in the future. Cool, and this is also for you, Mike from Philip. They're interested in using Mapbox 3D live navigation as an addition to their software. They're already a Mapbox user. Thank you. Uh, is there a timeline for this, or is it a private beta, or when when we think we're going to see this roll out? Yeah, so uh, th this is in uh, private beta right now with the with the Dash SDK, um, and I, I think this is something that, that we're going to be seeing making more available in in the near future. I think a lot of the the customizations to it um, is going to take some time, so we we don't necessarily have uh, I think the full flexibility to optimize it to the level of detail you can with maybe your existing maps through our through our style guide. Cool. Now, how would you sign up for that, Mike, for the private preview? Yeah. So it's uh, if you go to the the Dash SDK, um, and you can request that that way. 
So go to the uh, documentation site for the SDK and the signups there. That's correct. That's cool. Okay. So it's okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you're, you're just very popular to say, Mike. Um, Anna's asking, is there any plans to provide NAV SDK for offline use? Yeah, so the, the current navigation SDK is available for, for some levels of offline use. Um, it, it typically, it's not fully optimized for only being able to use offline, but if you were, for example, to start a route and then you were to lose, you know, lose service, uh, you would be able to continue that route even if you were to take a, you know, a, a wrong turn or two. Um, you'd be able to kind of continue that route and be optimized. You you just lose access to the powerful information from our online routing engine that includes traffic data um, and real-time incident updates. Mike, can you talk a little bit about how it the NAV SDK looks ahead at the planned route and kind of caches the information that it has? So even if you go under a bridge or lose connection, how that works? Yeah, exactly. So what the what the SDK is going to do once you start a route is it's going to look ahead at all of the all of the tiles and the road network that's needed, and it will pull into cache proactively uh, a a bunch of the the road network data needed to continue that navigation, but also if there were some slight deviations in in the path, uh, just in case that that we were to lose lose service. Right. We 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 take into account uh, that you know. Devices aren't perfect, even though we want them to be. And there's a lot of, there's some robust reliability things that most people don't really see and don't notice because, hey, I got navigated to the right spot and everything worked out great. And they never even realized that they lost connectivity or that, you know, maybe something did not go quite as right with the device. So cool. Thanks. Um, good about this. How does Mapbox provide the ability to build speed limit warnings? Um, Shrey, is that you? Uh, yeah, I can I, I can take that. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, we have the database of speed limits inside our road network. That's how we build um, guidance for uh, users live as they're building as they're driving around. So you can customers are building live speed limits shown as you're driving around. So we precisely know the location where you are uh, in the active navigation session. And so we precisely know the road uh, uh, road IDs and we know the rate speed limits what's available uh, live in the database. Uh, but we also provide, um, some customers are also like doing this backend use cases where you would need to understand at an aggregate fleet level, either real time or at a fleet level, how is your fleet and driver drivers um, w driving uh, and adhering to the speed limits? So this is something uh, it's possible with our uh, map matching API. And there are customers who are building exactly uh, for both uh, on live use cases and also on 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 uh, on demand for the backend. So I would encourage you to check out uh, some of the showcases from um, ANWB, who is one of the customers who have integrated navigation SDK and they're building speed limit warnings. If you are above the speed limits, you can show warnings live to the drivers. Um, as well as we have customers like Ford who are at the fleet level, they are tracking speed limits uh, across the, uh, and assessing the risk profile of their overall fleet. So if X percent of the drivers are going above certain kind of speed threshold, speed limit thresholds more frequently, there is more risk added to their fleet. Uh, that has some kind of a correlation with um, your insurance premiums and the overall risk of your driver uh, safety. Uh, and this you can, if you do it at one or two uh, driver level, it's less interesting, but when you have an, a largest fleet set, the data points become very, very actionable and, um, and you can have a lot of cost savings um, attached to it. So the APIs we offer today is map matching API. It gives you a robust way to track your GPS data and also get speed limit annotations, whatever the route you're driving on. And and by the way, it's available for uh, different modalities also. So in case you are not interested in speed limits, you just want to know, plan your bike routes or hiking routes, that's also possible with different um, modalities. Cool, thanks, Shrey. Um, from David, is navigation SDK supported by the latest version 11 maps SDK beta, or should we be using version 10 maps SDK as well? Mike. Yeah, so the 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 newer version is on is on dash um, the dash SDK. 
Cool. So they don't have to revert to the the older one to use it. That that's correct. Cool. Okay. Yeah, this is, cool. This is something that the that just to add a little bit more, the the team is actively working on. Uh, we are big fans of the maps of CK from the navigation SDK team. And this is something that the team is actively interested in working with. So yeah, stay tuned. Uh, that's just the case when I have the latest and greatest maps of CK. Right, now that we've got your attention, Antonio, here's another question for you. Alexander is asking, are there plans to collaborate with other companies or industries to enhance MapGPT's functionality? Uh, good question. Uh, thank you, Alexander, for asking it. Uh, Joe, so this is something that definitely is in our plans, right? Uh, probably you saw this as a theme today during build. Uh, we are all about customization and making sure that we are in a region to build your experience, right? And the experience that you need for your customers. So in the, in the, in the case of MapGPT, that means that we need to feed the right context to large language models to GPT so that they have access to the right information so that they can be helpful, right? So that means not only providing the right context in terms of the map context, right? So I think that Mapbox knows very well where you are, where are you heading, what's the traffic nearby, but also everything that you need to know uh, for your drive, like what's going to be your weather uh, uh, forecast, or uh, if you're driving to a place where you have a reservation, how do you have access to that reservation information? So uh, when you use MapGPT, there is this concept of actions, uh, which essentially is a way to uh, transform a user request into something that happens uh, so that uh, the user can get value out of the interaction. And for that, we are interested in working with other companies in terms of music or restaurant reservation, uh, things like that. And definitely interested in hearing from the audience if they have ideas and if they have a specific suggestion of, of companies or uh, actions that MyGPT should be taking while driving, uh, we are all ears. So not to put you totally on the spot, Antonio, but first I got my first chance to work with that GPTT a couple months ago in an actual vehicle head unit, and it was it was fascinating what it's able to do. What what do you kind of see over the next you know six months to a year where where we're going to be going with Chat GPT and kind of what what problems are we solving? That's so difficult to answer because for anyone following the space, like every week, everything changes and it's like a small revolution. So uh, if, if I were confident about how the, the sector sort of look like next six months, I probably would be lying to everybody. So I, I will not do that. Uh, but what we are really interested is in making sure that the experience is not only very helpful, right, so that we integrate with these um, other companies, other sources of information to make sure that you're getting what you need, what you drive, but also that we make it very natural, right? Like we want to make sure that uh, you are speaking, that you will be talking to another person, right? And you don't need to remember to say actions in a very specific format that otherwise the machine is not going to understand what you're trying to say. Uh, we wanted to make it very natural. We want to make sure that uh, the responses are also very natural, right? Very, very low latency. We want to make sure that it feels like a conversation. And then something super important is the quality of the data. Uh, anyone ha that has used um, chat GPT or one of these large language models, probably they have seen that these, they, they don't have access to real time data. Uh, they have the concept of hallucination. Some models are uh, trained with very old data. So one of the things that we are investing in Mapbox is uh, making sure that uh, we have custom models that have been uh, fine tuned for these use cases, but also that we feed these models the right data sources so that you don't see hallucinations, right? So if, you, if, the, if the map GPT product is telling you, hey, uh, there is a good restaurant downtown that I recommend you for Chinese food, that the restaurant actually exists, right? And it's not a hallucination. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, Antonio. Um, Ozzy's asking, oh, data question. How does Mapbox detect road closure and how fast a road closure can be detected, like an accident or a catastrophic emergency? Does the Nav library get this information in time to plan the route accordingly? I think that's right. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, that's how routes are safe and how we uh, create reliability. So there are two sets. So inside Mapbox, there are two sets of uh, what we call as closures. So one of the closures is more 
a uh, little bit we call it long term like seasonal road closures which happens let's say every year this road is blocked because it's a mountain road and these are closed from december 15 to let's say january of 25th uh, we have that data and we use a variety of uh, vendors and data sources publicly available and we have automated uh, pipelines who are data pipelines who are always processing these um, closures uh, to make sure the our data is always up to speed so 90, 95% of the stuff is automated. Uh, it's always running, always live in Mapbox, let's say um, cloud infrastructure, but there's always, uh, but we don't stop there. There's always humans in the loop to make sure the data, what you have and the outlier of information. We don't want to create a closure, which is like a phantom closure and makes you avoid a road, which is absolutely fine. So that's where we have this human-based systems and tools inside Mapbox where there are hundreds of uh, folks who are, who's, whose core job is to make sure the data you have, the map data is always live, fresh, and accurate. Um, and this, what this means is we are pushing updates to our road map data on a daily basis. So thousands and thousands of updates at a global level, uh, they get pushed uh, live every day. And once they're live, it, it becomes immediately available in any of the map services you're using, either on visualization on the maps or you're actually using routing or navigation SDKs. Um, so, that's on more static side, uh, but we believe that's not enough because you also have this live uh, constructions or live uh, incidents like accidents would happen anytime. Uh, similarly, we have a, a, a very automated kind of pipeline where we use uh, data from our uh, partners, uh, which is, and we have different partners at different geographies. Uh, for example, in US, uh, we work with a partner who aggregates data from uh, five or six vendors. And same thing with, let's say in Europe, we also work very closely with certain uh, states, so certain countries, uh, government agencies who publish the live closures, live incidents, even if there is like a a, a pet, a dog on the road, uh, we, we get that information if it's available in, and it's relevant for that kind of a geography uh, because that leads to like lane closures and things like that. So this is available through our live traffic data feed. Uh, Up, oh, Trey. He froze up again. So what I was kind of getting to is that we do, we collect, I think, Craig or Thermo, Chris, this might be, or Robert, you might know better. It's 700 billion traces a week, I believe. And we use, we update our live traffic um, every five minutes, so 12 times an hour. So all of a sudden, if we see one of these traces on a road segment, all of a sudden go you know, stops because we can, we anonymize all of our SDK users and everyone who's using it. And so we can see, we have a general feel of what's going on, like within a municipality, we'll see within five minute increments that, hey, this road network at between these nodes has stopped. So then we'll go and we will reroute around that. Sure, you're back. I hope I didn't steal your thunder too bad. No, that's right. No, I think my network is glitching just at the right time. So yeah, that, that's right. So live data is within one to two, two, three minutes is an average. It's more on an average basis, which is always reflecting. But yeah, until five minutes is something we consider like an upper limit and that's available. Um, so if there's an incident, it'll show up live incident. It'll show up immediately on your navigation system. Uh, if there's a closure, which is good to know, like a lane closure, but doesn't influence your route path selection, It'll be available in route directions API response uh, under the incidents category. If you're in, in the live traffic mode, you can ask for these kind of annotations uh, from the API. But if there are closures which impact, let's say, your route selection, if the road is closed, then automatically, if you're in a live traffic mode of the driving profile, then it'll those roads would automatically be avoided. And same thing, uh, if you are using just visual representation of the map traffic map, uh, you can also pick and choose what kind of incidents are relevant. You can customize in our Mapbox beautiful maps uh, what makes sense for your use case. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, fully supported. Uh, and this is global cool. coverage uh, for us. Yeah, we we cover like literally the entire planet with very, very few exceptions. And it's all one of the, one of the unique characteristics about Mapbox is that the only people who use Mapbox data are Mapbox to improve our products and you as a customer. We don't fuel an ad engine. We don't go out and say, hey, we have all this demographic data. We have, we have isolated and anonymized and 
pretty much we jam it all together into these. Even our traffic data product is not just one or two, it's thousands and thousands of traces just averaged into one. So we we take privacy very seriously. We understand that a lot of our customers work in very, very competitive markets where the margins are thin and the ability to interact and getting their, their what what their special sauce is, is the data that they have on their customers and how they use that data. And, and we respect that, we protect that. And it's just part part of our, the DNA of what made Mapbox work. So Jordan is asking, is there any options to allow Mapbox Directions API to limit the roads used to route generation to follow certain compliances, specifically HAZMAT, HRCQ? I haven't heard that one. H HRCQ is a new acronym for me. And so the route to the user would be guaranteed to follow such restrictions. If not, this is something you plan to implement. I'm going to start out first, and then I'll pass it over to Shrey um, for the specifics around. The answer is kind of. We then the reason we have that is hazmat routing specifically is not got the data is not governed by like one place or two places or even a dozen places. There's some depending on what kind of road you're on and where that road is located, it might be the city, it might be a state that owns the data, it might be a city, it might be certain parts of the city that own that data, and it's not a consistent and easy to digest and very it's very difficult from a liability standpoint as to if we route you down the wrong road how how does that work from the end user so we we have right now it's it's part of the things in my roadmap that I really want to do but it's 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 a harder problem than you thought simply not because you know it's like hey we can't ingest roads cuz Shrey will tell you that you know we can we can exclude motorways, we can exclude speed limits, we can exclude areas, we can do all kinds of stuff like that. But hazmat in particular is a data problem that's really a tough nut to crack. Um, sure, you want to talk a little bit more about like, you know, vehicle sizes and the way we can route specific vehicles around? Yeah, that's right. Some of these characteristics are yeah, underlying to like your like vehicle type, like Ryan was saying, exactly. So if you are a particular kind of a vehicle beyond a certain size limits. Uh, in directions API, what our customers are using is they'll specify their height, weight, uh, width restrictions as well. And in some parts of the world, width plays a big role. If you are a wider kind of a vehicle and there are alleyways which you definitely want to avoid. Uh, so those are def those are available already in the directions API and our customers are already running live uh, the production apps. And Road Trippers is a, a very good example. And one thing I'll also share with like how some customers are doing uh, hazmat uh, restrictions is uh, usually those are not too many depending on uh, how like how big of a region you are operating your fleet and your use case is. Uh, some customers what they're using is this point exclusion, which um, like you can specify certain points like tunnels or specific intersections which you think are unsafe or not you're su not supposed to enter those road road categories um the data is a little bit disjointed uh what we see and we're trying uh, very hard right now to get to a point where all the data like hazmat and tunnels they become so uh, well cleaned up inside mapbox so we can offer it to all customers but until we do a lot of the customers are using very specific uh, data sets from uh, certain agencies or from their own driver feedback pool you can use point exclusions. It's almost like a version of bring your own data custom set inside routing. And uh, even if you have like few dozens of hazmat areas, which are like the most probable pro uh, problem areas, you can very easily bring it to the routing en engine. Uh, and these are all like real time API customizations. So you can also build a logic around uh, some customers are using, hey, if you are in certain parts of let's say states or countries, these are the set of like hazmat restrictions are what relevant and they use in routing. But if you're in a different, uh, country all together, then you can uh, pick and choose uh, and you can customize this through your own cloud or through your own uh, application. You can build those kind of uh, like smart smart logic. Uh, but yes, we do plan to bring all of these data layers like out of the box uh, like, uh, soon in the roadmap. So. Cool. So this question is for Fawaz. I saw the launch of EV Charge Finder API. What information does Charge Finder API provide? provide about the EV station. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, so we've um, we've been working on this for a while and we're happy to 
to launch this API to help EV drivers and, and developers to build um, solutions that are enabling EV drivers to find charging stations uh, around them. So we are um, working with multiple CPOs or EMSPs or aggregators across um, across the world in, in North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand to provide uh, live data about EV stations. Um, so we have address, uh, location address, uh, opening hours. Um, is it accessible for drivers or is it by, privately part of a, a, a community building or a, an office building? Um, so we are um, providing information about the charging speed, plug types available, um, compatibility with vehicles, as well as price um, of the station, but mainly focusing on uh, making, as as Trey was mentioning about the freshness of the data. So we're updating at the live location of that station. Is it operational? When was it used? Uh, uh, how many uh, plugs or uh, connectors are available at that moment? So really focusing on giving the user the ability to find stations around them um, with live availability uh, that helps them select which station they want to go to. Um, we're also... Um, uh, enrich the data with um, through Mapbox uh, POI data with amenities around that location. So we know that EV drivers not only want to know what is available at the, what, how many stations are available, but they also want to know the context of the location around that station. So, you know, going back to uh, our location strategy and how can Mapbox help with location. So helping around, you know, amenities around that location and, and what can you find from restaurants, uh, playgrounds, coffee shops, giving a more context to that location, particularly for the EV station uh, location. Great, thanks. All right, Antonio, is voice the only way to interact with MapGPT? No, it isn't. Um, one of the things that we envision for MapGPT is that it definitely enables uh, natural language interaction. And when we think of nat natural language interaction, we normally think of voice, which is definitely very helpful when you're driving. Uh, when you're driving, you don't want to keep, uh, you, you want to keep your eyes on the road. You want to keep your hands on the wheel, right? You don't want to be distracted by the map or the app that you're trying to interact with. So. Uh, definitely voice is a very natural and safe uh, mean of communication with MapGPT, but MapGPT is also supported on mobile devices, not only in auto. So that means that if you are building, for example, a companion app for, an, uh, for a car or simply a standalone mobile app, when you are on mobile, uh, voice still remains a very natural way of interacting with MapGPT, but also typing uh, in form of a chat mode in terms of text mode is also important. That is also supported. And both of them are um, uh, synchronized. So if you have part of the conversation while typing uh, and then you continue using voice, the memory of the conversation will be kept for you automatically. So uh, all that context uh, will be maintained and then the conversation will be natural. And something that I'm actually uh, very interested to see in, in, in the real world is uh, that also means that the context, the memory is shared across devices. So for example, you could start a conversation with your mobile phone at home, right? Start looking for a place you want to go, check out uh, the ratings, check out the traffic to get to that destination. And then when you get in the car, you don't need to remember names, addresses, or do uh, a strange synchronization between apps or things like that. You can just simply go to my GPT and say, hey, remember the restaurant we were talking about? Let's drive there and it will know everything that you need to know, right? It will really know which restaurant you're talking about, it will know the address, it will know what to do on your car. So yeah, we see this as a, as a natural way to not only interact with MapGPT, but interact with the product across devices. Cool, and we look kind of to expand on that, Ozzy's asking, what are the new innovations or capabilities that NAV plans to pursue as part of a new AI map development? Yeah, when we're talking about uh, MapGPT and, and the AI map, I think that step number one is making sure that all the map context that Mapbox knows really well and that is available through the tooling is available to AI, right? 
all that work to figure out what is the right context to show, uh, how you keep that in the memory of AI, how do you validate that information is available and correct all these things, we take care of it for you, right? So the, the, the biggest thing that MapGPT does is removing a lot of work that you will need to build anyway, it doesn't matter what kind of map interaction you need to build with uh, AI and maps, basically all that planning work, uh, MapGPT takes care of, right? And it does it using the latest technologies in terms of AI, both for large language models, but also for voice generation and, and speech to text detection, right? We are using new models that are being created to make sure that the voices are very natural, right? And that the interactions are very low latency. So I think that's the, the step number one. Step number two is actually hearing for, from people here in this audience, right? Like right now, MapGPT, uh, if you have been seeing uh, the, the announcements and you'll be looking at our website, it's available today, right? It's, in a, it's available in private preview. And this is a perfect moment to start looking at it so that you can share early feedback about what we're building so that you can shape the future of the product. So right now we are basically taking all this feedback uh, that, that all these customers starting to build with MapGPT to understand what is missing, what's the gap, so that when we start making the product more available, more public, has all those features. So yeah, please keep the, the feedback coming. Cool, thank you. So next question, in Isochron's APIs, besides the recently released part at what other features are we expecting over the next year? Cool, actually I get to answer a question. Um, so Isochron's is one of our, it's a very unique product because we just thought when we released it that, hey, it's great, it builds a polygon and you can like search inside the polygon or you can put it on a map and you can just see how far things are. And we are astounded every day on the new ways customers are using isochrones. We we have customers like all trails who are using it. Hey, find all the trails within two hours. So make a polygon, do a search and then share it with my friends. We're finding some business intelligence use cases in backend analytics that we're going to be we're going to be announced to partnership soon with some of the big BI companies on how they're doing things for store planning and for for customer interactions and you know one of my biggest customers of Isochrones it's funny they buy a lot of Isochrones they're like oh where are you using it for and their answer is none of your business and, I mean there there are things that people are using Isochrones for that we never dreamed of when we first put it out there so one of the things we first did and that's why it was to part at and depart at is a something that's been asked for for a long time. It uses map boxes to store traffic over the past 90 days. That the thing that I was talking about earlier about you know collecting road traces and understanding on a five minute level basis how traffic and the range changes based on historic traffic conditions. It's so you can start planning. Hey, if you're for instance a coffee shop chain, if it probably your busy time is morning rush hour and the morning rush hour you need to know how far across you know how far away so that you can always hit 80 or 90 percent of your your addressable market within a municipality and it's very different than the afternoon yeah you know, three o'clock in the afternoon when people are getting a different coffee break how the traffic works out so the next kind of things that we're looking we and our customers came to us with that that was not something we thought you know good enough was good enough using typical traffic and because of the power of a lot of these analytics and BI platforms that it goes, it's like people are coming back, yeah, typical traffic was great last year, but we've gotten our models down so specific that we want to talk minute to minute, not just day to day. So that was our first one. Our second, one of the ones we've also been asked very recently is avoid motorways. And one, if you were in the directions keynote or speak a few before this, you want our customers this picnic and picnic those little electric vehicles only go 50 kilometers per hour. And they want to keep their vehicles in spaces that only go have the speed limit 50 kph. And they don't want to route them in places that are, you know, maybe you saw they've got tiny little like, you know, 30 centimeter wheels on them. They don't want to go over older roads with cobblestones because it does so it the maintenance costs on replacing tires increases and they their suspension is different because they're heavy. They're electric vehicles and they got the big battery. So we're doing the next sort of things we're looking at is 
doing, you know, avoiding motorways and avoiding places where, you know, speed limited. Um, also EV routing. And that's going to go into matrix as well, because we're, as I said earlier, 40, you're seeing a 40% total cost of ownership within for vehicles that are electric. Now, just from personal experience, from when I had to manage a vehicle fleet as a logistics manager, we were, if you could shave, you know, 20 cents off of a daily vehicle usage, you are getting promoted. 40% is something that is a number that is hard to describe how this is going to affect the, the logistics, just the entire industry, because your whole cost calculations are going to change dramatically. Your whole ability, you know, in the past, you would say, hey, you know, every 6,000 miles, we're going to have to take a vehicle off service for one day to change the oil. That's gone. Um, and when you're a big logistics provider and have thousands of vehicles, you know, one day doesn't seem like much for one, but, you know, multiplied across, you know, some of our smaller providers have 6,000 vehicles, each one driving, you know, somewhere upwards of 500 miles a day sometimes, you know, you're, you are essentially getting 40% of your vehicle fleet back for free. So we're doing, we're going to integrate EV routing into both our isochrones and our matrix so that we can, we can maximize that because we do see that coming. All of our, all of our logistics customers are, electrical is not just, you know, it's wonderful for the environment. It does great things as far as vehicle dynamics, but the real end of the day, it's this incredible cost savings. So those are the two big ones coming up. The third one that's kind of smaller that we're seeing is people want to avoid tolls. I don't blame them. I don't like tolls either. But it's but what a lot of people it's like, hey, you know, we this is a cost reduction thing. As I said, you know, if you're if you're saving 20 cents a vehicle per day, sometimes that that's that's a major achievement. I never paid a 20 cent toll. They're all more expensive than that. So there is a lot of our our customers are using models that are not just give me the fastest route, not just give me the shortest route, give me the route that is the most economically viable. So those are the three big ones we see in the future. Avoid motorways and and uh, speed limits, avoid tolls, and EV routing. Cool. Thanks for that question. So David's asking, what's the best way to get support for adding navigation SDK to your existing app? Mike. Yeah, so the the best place you could start is if you wanted to start playing around with it, you know, today right now you could go to the to the SDK page and download the the navigation SDK and look at the docs there uh, to get to get started. Um, if yeah, I, I think that 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 should should get any developer started on on this, uh, and if there's any questions, then reach out. So, and the best way you can reach out is we have a Discord channel. Chris, if you could do it, if Chris runs the Discord channel, um, do you have any, any commentary on that? Or can you just put a link into the chat? Yeah, I'll drop a link. Just a moment. Outstanding. Thank you so much. We monitor that Discord channel pretty, pretty regularly. I... I will I will admit my guilt right here. I don't get I don't look at it as much as I should, but Chris will always and his team will always push it to me and uh, they'll hit me on Slack. Like, hey, we've got a question that we can't answer. And you've got guys like Robert who are in there who can a lot of times will be able to answer your questions right away. Um, I will say too, I played around with the SDK. I am not a developer by any stretch of the imagination. I I stopped putting code into computers about 18 years ago, but I could get the SDK running in about four hours on a bare bones basis. It's a, it's built to be extremely easy to get going. And then once you've got it going, extremely flexible with all the different parameters you can adjust from, you know, map colors all the way up to, you know, avoid motorways and how, how many times it refreshes the route for things. There's, there's all it, but getting started is not the hard part trying to figure out because most of our developers who look at it are using it is like, I didn't know we could do all this stuff. And now we're overwhelmed by choice. One thing that I would add, uh, and, and I think David was asking also uh, about what is the, the, the best way to start, even with an existing app, um, I recommend you to look at what we call the drop-in UI in Navigation SDK. Uh, that is definitely the easiest way to start. Uh, this is something that is available across iOS and Android. And it gives you a starting point very quickly. And it should work with a new app, with an existing app. 
And essentially, it takes a lot of decisions for you at the beginning, right? So you don't need to think about too many things when you are thinking about the basic experience that you want to do in your app, how, how that's integrated with your app. And then later, if you want to go a lower level and start changing things, you can, right? But dropping UI will, will get you set up very quickly. Great. OK, another EV question for followers. How does EV routing API provide battery estimations? Yeah, I, I can take that one. That's okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, we did discuss discuss about EV routing doing multiple things. One of them is uh, the foundation is like range prediction. Uh, so rather than using historical trends of your average ener energy efficiencies, we what we use is forward looking energy uh, depletion. So what is the road ahead? How does that look like? How are the live traffic conditions? Uh, is there elevation and topography changes which are relevant for consumption profiles? For example, if you go, if you're stuck in uh, traffic, um, you're not expending as much energy in EV versus we would spend more on ice. Uh, this is the data point we have. And same thing if you're running very on high speeds roads, um, usually EV efficiencies goes down a little bit uh, than compared to our ice counterparts. And same thing with elevation, you go up, you deplete at a much higher rate versus you going down, You some most of the EVs are able to recover the energy back. And how much that recovery happens depends on models. That's also, API can also accept that as a flexible parameter to do so. Um, if it's okay, maybe I can uh, do a quick screen share um, and see if uh, I can give add some visuals behind what I'm saying. Great. I, I hope the screen should be showing up. Uh, so this is one trip. Let's say we are in US. You're going from we're doing a like four hour trip. It's like a long trip, longest trip. You're going from Washington DC to somewhere in New York, and this is your regular route. Uh, what if you just switch to uh, uh, electric uh, electric vehicle? You can see automatically you get two things immediately. You see the color code color lines change on this route line, and what we are demonstrating here is just one click of a button. You can go and play in this playground. Uh, you see you start green, you have much higher energy curve. And then as you go uh, down uh, the route line, you see your energy depletion curves change. And this is factoring in all the right, uh, right kind of like road traffic conditions and topography. You would notice there is a bump in here and that is uh, effectively showing you uh, like there was a charging session here and there was one stop automatically added by the EV routing API. So it gives you full prediction of where are the areas where you'll be like low in, uh, energy levels or maybe sufficient, depending on what are the user preferences. And you can customize different UIs uh, very easily. So this is the case of, let's say we have added some presets. These are not specific to models, but just to get you uh, have quick access to the playground. Uh, Chris here, who helped us build this kind of a playground for us um, in this call. So you can see for a sedan, like a 70 kilowatt battery, you can uh, you can model it's like a pre-model curves for consumption curves your charging curves you can see on your left hand on the screen it's already preset so you can play around and if you have to change these values uh, free to take a, take a look at the documentation and change those so for example if i go from a sedan which has a higher battery pack to a, a hatchback which is smaller you immediately notice the uh, the number of charging curves changes because there's not enough charge to make the trip with just one stop and you can now see which are the most efficient stops along this trip and these are coming from a pre-ingested data which mapbox ev platform team has on all the stations around this area so you can create these kind of beautiful curves if uh, if it helps uh, visualize how the trip is going to be uh, behave for the trip for the driver Take another example here. Uh, you can also create, uh, you get more information about, let's say, sometimes users don't want to plan the trip um, uh, from coming from automatic systems. And user wants to have a little bit more control. So let's say that you're in uh, Brussels to Amsterdam. Again, it's like a short, longish trip, medium long, medium long trip. You go, let's say, in electric mode. I'm trying to simulate here without adding any stop, just to understand how my range is going to look like. You can see here. We, you can create these kind of visuals. Uh, this is just playground. You can create visuals, hey, exactly where you're going to run out of charge and likely where you would need uh, some of the charging uh, stations to be picked up. So you can surface the stations around this area. So you have more of a guided experience for uh, some of the users who would want to have more control. Maybe they want to have uh, a bite at the restaurant while they're having charge uh, charge of charging their vehicles. So you can play around with these kind of information availability, availability uh, in the route line and live station 
database and you can create these experiences uh, very easily from the API. Uh, so if I simulate, let's say I do need a stop here, uh, you can see here uh, uh, that it also becomes available uh, in, in, in real time. But if, it's also possible that if you have a larger battery pack, uh, you probably don't need to have a stop at all. So you can see here a full charging curve. You can tell the user, hey, by the way, you'll run, you'll be able to reach to your destination with sufficient charge, but it's not enough. So it's up to you if you want to charge, uh, take a stop or not stop. And user has all the information available to make those kind of decisions upfront. Great. Uh, uh, um, I do want that. Thanks, Chris. Um, I appreciate you dropping that link in there. I, I, I do want to point out that a lot of our products have playgrounds and demos built into them. Um, Ice crowns and optimization, I know off top of my help head as well. And I know they've got like map styles over on their size and all kinds of things like that. So, and we also have, if you don't know, a absolutely generous free tier. We are a developer first company. We believe that you need enough flexibility to build your products and understand your products to before actually going to prod and we we understand that and give you a lot to play with so don't hesitate if you don't already to to just go and use our your free tier it's it's plenty to get you started um even though some of our small applications are still they're they're using free tier and one day when they grow up and become the next fang we we will be right there with you um, new question. Does Charge Finder API support charging session payments? Uh, who gets to answer that? I can take that one, uh, Ryan. Oh. Yes. So we do um, support payments. Um, we can work with uh, numbers of the payment uh, processing providers like uh, who can provide a capability for us to hook up our payment platform. Um, and we also support uh, providing like a wallet service for customers and developers who want to build an application that supports payments and charging stations uh, um, uh, payment for for their vehicle or for the drivers. Um, we're focused in in North America and Europe markets so far, so we have uh, availability of major um, stations and major networks that uh, supports. Uh, payment. We can also remote start and stop stations sessions for charging stations. Um, so that's something we can help you with if you're interested and uh, happy to hear from you on, on that topic. Cool. Thank you. We've got time for one last question. Does Map GPT support non-English languages? I know the answer, but I'll let Antonio. It does. Yes, that's one of the advantages of working with large language models. Uh, they do support many languages in the world, and we leverage that functionality to support multiple languages out of the box. Uh, and we um, are careful to do it as well when it comes to voice interactions, right? Because it's not only about the large language model to be able to understand you, but also the mechanisms on your uh, device to be able to get your speech into text and then the response into speech, right? So we have a flexible system for speech to text and text to speech systems so that it supports multiple languages. We provide reference implementations, but also we allow bringing your own so if you are building an application and you have your own partnership with some of these providers or you have your own models uh, to handle voice interactions you can provide your own as well cool thanks so much we are at time i really appreciate everyone's participation today we have some fantastic questions from developers all over um we've made us think too we're going to go back and take some of these questions and maybe turn them into actions i want well, to thank antonio robert shrey fawaz mike for helping us out here as well as chris for running it we can't wait to see what you're going to build until next year bye now <laughs>